But uh, I'm very pleased to have uh, Brett Gustafson here to introduce him to you. Brett is an assistant professor of soci sociocultural anthropology at Washington University in St. Louis. And he's worked for many years on um, questions of language and education in Latin America. And uh, he began working in Guatemala and has worked with the Associ Association of the Guarani People in Bolivia since 1992. And uh, so he has a long-standing relationship with organizations in the region and has been able to follow a very interesting process down there. And he was there during a crucial time as well. In the mid-1990s is a time we normally think about as the heyday of neoliberalism in Bolivia. This is when um, Gonzalo Sanchez de Lozada was um, spearheading uh, not only the ongoing transformation of political and economic structures in the country, but a whole series of cultural reforms uh, at the center of, of which was educational reform. And within the, um, the educational reform process, the Guarani people were really at the forefront of everyone's attention. There was a great deal of innovation, experimentation going on at the time. I think that in some of the treatments of uh, what's called neoliberal multiculturalism, there has been a lot of, uh, rightfully, a lot of skepticism about what that was all about. And it's often been seen as a kind of window, window dressing for the more nefarious neoliberal uh, economic reforms. Um, and so there have been different critiques of it from a, from a straight kind of class uh, perspective. Um, from a kind of Foucauldian uh, post-structuralist perspective about uh, state intentions and in, uh, disciplining the population. A lot of the critiques that have been seen, I think, from the top down, and uh, Brett was in the region at the time and was able to see what was going on locally and is able to talk about that process from a very different perspective. He looks at a lot of different actors, state actors, uh, non-governmental organizations, as well as local indigenous groups. But we can see, one of the things that we can get from his work is more of a bottom-up perspective on what was going on and see much more what the process meant for indigenous actors and what their stakes were in being involved in the uh, educational reform process. So Brett published an important article when he was still a graduate student at Harvard in 2002 called Paradoxes of Liberal Indigenism, Indigenous Movements, State Process, and Intercultural Reform in Bolivia, which came out in David Mabry Lewis's volume called Identities and Conflict. And Brooks, uh, sorry, Brett's um, book just Brooks came out last year. I, that was not a completely arbitrary slip, but um, Brett's book, has just come out, New Languages of the State, Indigenous Resurgence, and the Politics of Knowledge in Bolivia uh, from Duke last year. And rather than comment on the book, I wanted to read uh, the comments of one of the reviewers who's with us here tonight, Brooke Larson from uh, SUNY Stony Brook. She says, a beautifully crafted, magnificently expansive, and inspiring work of engaged historical ethnography. Brett is blushing. <laughs> uh, sorry, it's going to continue. Uh, Brett Gustafson traces Bolivia's heralded experiment in bilingual education by planting it deep in the subsoil of Guarani culture and politics and by projecting against the larger canvas of neoliberal reformism in the 1990s. In plotting the choreography of state NGO and grassroots struggles over indigenous knowledge and schooling, Gustafson opens up new horizons on Bolivia's vibrant Guarani movement and its radicalizing agendas in the early 2000s. This is quite simply the work of a seasoned anthropologist and gifted writer. So um, it makes you want to run out, run out and, and buy it. Um, I would just add that Brett is the co-editor of two forthcoming volumes. One is called Rethinking Intellectuals in Latin America with Mabel Morania and another called Remapping Bolivia Resources, Territory, and Indigeneity in a Plurinational State uh, with Nicole Fabricant. And his talk tonight is entitled Epistemic Rupture, Affirmative Action, or Reverse Racism? Question mark. Decolonizing Knowledge Enables Bolivia. So, welcome to that. Thank you. 
Now I'm really nervous. <laughs> uh, the foundation of Carmen and thanks Sinclair and Clarks for making this happen. I haven't been in New York in about 10 years, so this has been a kind of a treat. Um, and I should say, we weren't friends or anything when she wrote that, so <laughs> it actually counts, I think. So thank you, Brooke. Um, so um, as Sinclair described very well, my, my, this project, which was probably took longer than it should have and lasted longer than it should have, uh, tried to talk about or think about uh, decolonization through the education field, um, asking basically what decolonization might mean in Bolivia, um, and asking whether or not uh, these transformations in education would achieve that thing. Um, and I'll say a little bit about the book, but what I want to talk about more is, is, is a more general snapshot of, of how I see Bolivia today. So shifting beyond the sort of lead up to the moment of Evo and asking, Okay, now we've had uh, four years of the mass, and we have a, def a definitive break. There has been a break in the, what I've, you could say is the colonial grammar of the state, the, the, the structural grammar of the state, which historically divided uh, Indios as the ruled from Criollos as the rulers. So that has certainly been broken. However, when we dig more deeply in to ask what coloniality and decolonization might mean, there are much more tentative shifts, uh, and, and many, many questions remain. Um, so, uh, basically the book departs from an idea that if coloniality is about primarily a racialized uh, language of power um, that combines, uh, that sort of replicates itself in various dimensions of, of state form, daily life, uh, social relations, uh, uh, racialized ideologies of identity and so forth. It is also about structural inequality. So what I tried to do in the book, and you all can judge whether it was successful, was to rejoin uh, uh, an approach to indigeneity which often focuses on identity, epistemic questions, language and so forth, with the more structural uh, look at uh, political economic inequalities. Uh, so those two dimensions of coloniality are, are how I see uh, Bolivia, and um, not to give away the book, uh, maybe you won't even read it, but I argue that, as, as always, that certain transformations did, uh, did obtain with uh, bilingual education, but uh, these were tentative shifts, some of which uh, are, uh, were not durable transformations. So I'll try to make reference to some of those. Um, I should say that I, I'm not directly working on education right now, so some of you may have more updated knowledge. Uh, I've started a new project on natural gas, which um, in my rather artisanal map here of Bolivia, um, it's not meant to look like Texas, although some of these <laughs> folks wish it was Texas. Um, the Andes, of course, uh, over here, Santa Cruz, the sort of bastion of right-wing opposition to Evo in the east, and the large gas reserves are here in the southern Andean front, uh, where it goes into the Chaco lowlands. These gas reserves are sort of the, 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 the epicenter of all of the talk about nationalization of gas, the gas war of 2003, and a new economy which is largely gas funded. Uh, most of that gas is, is worked by Petrobras, the Brazilian oil company, about 80% of it, uh, and about 80% of it goes to Brazil. This number will mean nothing but over 30 million cubic meters of gas a day flow eventually through a pipeline that eventually arrives to Sao Paulo. So this is also very new and I'll make some reference to that as it relates to coloniality and to education. Um, but uh, how I see the current situation is that you have uh, a, a discourse of decolonization on the one hand which is attached to the rise of uh, ind indigeneity as an accepted category of state craft. Um, but you also have a more familiar uh, discourse, or familiar in the sense of, of state-led development uh, uh, spheres, of productivism, of productivismo, uh, which is focused on recovering sovereignty over resources and recapitalizing the state through state-led accumulation. So I don't see these as in absolute contradiction, but there are certainly tensions between a model of decolonization, which is based on 
the uh, creation of space for plurality, and a model of productivism which relies on centralized state control and the prior prioritization of resource extraction for the capitalization of the state. So you have what I'm thinking about now is you, sovereignty over resources does bring in uh, uh, rents that can be redirected towards domestic transformations, and this is part of the, the ongoing process. But there's a possibility that resource extraction, resource flows themselves start having their own kind of sovereignty, and that the logic of resource extraction uh, overwhelms other emergent processes. So that's uh, kind of how I see the, the current uh, conjuncture. Um, So Sinclair did a great job of summarizing the parts that I could skip over here. So um, the well, let me just go ahead and jump in here, and then we'll see we'll see where we get. So um, as most of you probably know, the rise of indigenous peoples movements in Latin America has generated uh, new debates on the direction of politics, the transformation of the state and of course uh, the discourse of decolonization and plurinationalism have uh, promised or tentatively uh, radically transformed the discourse of neoliberalism. So uh, uh, what was once a, a promotion of competition, uh, individual striving and growth has reasserted a language of anti-imperialism, sovereignty, control over resources, and state-led development. Um, the place of education in this transformation is what I'll say a bit about and what follows. Um, and what I want to do is just draw some comparisons between the intercultural education reform that was launched in 1994 and the emergent proposal for a decolonizing intercultural and intracultural education law that arose after the election of Evo Morales in 2005. And in the midst of this, there's another contested category, which is that of indigenous knowledge, uh, which I'll say a little bit about. Um, basically, as, as Sinclair said, the education reform of the 1990s came under the auspices of the World Bank, was part of the wider neoliberal project meant to downsize education bureaucr bureaucracies, weaken the teachers' union, decentralize educational control, and so forth, and similar in many countries of the world. Um, Bilingual intercultural education was an appendage to that process, an appendage largely funded by European donors, but it was also tactically useful to the state. And even though they did not put large resources into it, they put it forth as their, their sort of uh, uh, their, 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 uh, their central program. Um, when Evo was elected in 2005, there was immediate discussion of a new education law that would do away with the damned law of, of neoliberalism, the, the education reform law of 1994. Uh, the new education law was stalled for, uh, basically has been stalled for about four years because of this uh, often violent right-wing opposition to Evo. So the first four years of, of the Masa's rule was occupied not with deepening transformations of education, but with maintaining power and establishing effective hegemony and sovereignty over the state, which Evo did not have and arguably still does not entirely hold. Um, so uh, what I want to do is question a, a, a notion of indigenous knowledge that often propels many discussions on decolonization. Uh, and that notion is the sense of indigenous knowledge as a kind of a, a closed cosmology or closed worldview that exists in, in, in stark opposition to Western knowledge, which is also frequently essentialized as something like science. Um, and I follow folks like Arturo Escobar here who are, are rethinking indigenous knowledge as a networked yet territorially grounded social practices. Um, so I'm going to think about these two divergent views as I describe the neoliberal period and what might come of the decolonization period. The view of indigenous knowledge as, as a closed corpus, almost a philosophy, an alternative cosmology, and indigenous knowledge as networked and articulatory, and in fact a, a geopolitical praxis, uh, we might say. Um, 
the other sort of argument of the book and what we should think about here is oftentimes in anthropology we hear education and our eyes roll back and we go to sleep uh, uh, because uh, educational anthropology is oftentimes trapped within the classroom walls uh, and I was not, I'm not an educational anthropologist and I argue that another shift that we, had to we have to take as researchers is to look beyond classroom practices when we talk about the politics of education and the politics of indigenous knowledge. Um, sorry, I'm glossing over some of the background here, um, which you, you all might already know. Um, so distinct from the education reform launched by the World Bank in 1994, decolonization promises to go beyond what were called the interculturalist reforms. Um, in the context of interculturalism, the moderate discourse of liberal cultural rights allowed for the recognition of linguistic and cultural difference within a standardized model of governance and knowledge. Yet decolonization suggests both an embrace of the creative potential and a recognition of the political authority embedded in alternative visions of knowledge and ways of speaking. Uh, Walter Mignolo has a useful phrase here. He says, we're not just talking about cultural rights, we're talking about epistemic rights, the rights to produce authorized knowledge and claim the political power that adheres there too. Um, there was also in the intercultural era very little said explicitly about race and class inequality, two categories that were uh, largely absent from discussions of education, uh, sort of like the elephant in the room that nobody could talk about, so they talked about interculturalism. Uh, and uh, now under decolonization, these are two categories that have surged to the forefront, so conjoining the question of epistemic rights with a critique of, of uh, racialized class inequality. And uh, as you might imagine, if put into practice, this, this view of, of education and by extension this view of state transformation does promise uh, some distinctive shifts from the neoliberal period. Um, in the longer version of this article, which may get published someday, uh, uh, I actually take up some work that Brooke did uh, to talk about indigenous knowledge, she doesn't know this, um, uh, to juxtapose uh, visions of indigenous knowledge uh, historically and curriculum historically with the present. And the example I use is that of the Indian household. Um, in the early 1900s, maybe I'll say a little bit about it. Uh, the early 1900s, we had the sort of period of liberal nation building and uh, education, uh, as Brooke is doing work on this, this period, uh, education planners in the Bolivian government saw the Andean household as a problematic space that had to be uh, uh, addressed and uh, focused in a kind of a biopolitical mode on problematizing the place of the Andean, specifically the Aymara woman. Um, and you might imagine where, where that takes you basically into uh, a notion of indigenous peoples as needing improvement to become like more like urban middle class folks and um, an understanding of education is focusing on issues such as morality, uh, hygiene, and the family. Um, and arguably, the intercultural reform of the 1990s had a similar view of indigenous peoples. Uh, it saw indigenous peoples and knowledges and languages as the problem to be addressed by interculturalism. Uh, interculturalism itself was understood not as an opening toward uh, some sort of autonomous knowledge production, but as a means for accessing or opening up indigenous peoples to the outside, which in empirical terms goes completely against reality because most of the indigenous Bolivians are already broadly open uh, to the whatever might be the outside society, and those who have a more closed uh, sort of sense of the world are actually the non-indigenous Bolivians, at least in the part of the country where I worked uh, here in the southeast. Um, nonetheless, this problematization of the Indian, I suggest, replicated this earlier 20th century view, and the uh, Foucauldian view here is applicable to what uh, the education reform tried to achieve with interculturalism, which was uh, problematizing individual uh, transformations, much as the 19th, late 19th and early 20th century did, so, such that issues of self-esteem, uh, uh, 
becoming literate and numerate, being made into a useful labor force, albeit one that might speak two languages, was the extent of interculturalism in the neo, in the neoliberal and its neoliberal form. Um, in contrast, I, I have had discussions, probably too many over too many years, with indigenous intellectuals and. One space of conversation that I have uh, with a group of indigenous intellectuals is about what indigenous knowledge might mean when transposed into schooling, if not this intercultural thing which problematizes indigeneity. And um, here we see the limits of bilingual intercultural education as a decolonizing practice. Uh, in most cases, indigenous educators and intellectuals will confront the problem as being one of inserting or uh, bringing in indigenous knowledge forms into the classroom, into textbooks. Um, in other words, uh, okay, we have to teach a unit on the natural sciences, so this is how uh, standard sciences does it, so how are we going to bring in our knowledge form alongside of, of standard sciences? Um, you, you, maybe you can't imagine the limits of that, but what that does is textualizes knowledge practices. It does not preserve them, it doesn't revitalize them, it doesn't uh, maintain the spaces in which they, they are reproduced, it simply reconverts them. Charlie Charles Briggs uh, argues it decontextualizes and reintextualizes knowledge in a different form uh, for different purposes, such that uh, uh, curricular practice in the classroom, whether it's in Aymara, Guarani, or Spanish, does replicate the disciplinary model of knowledge that, that Foucault spent so much time writing about. That is, uh, it doesn't matter what language you speak, if you are seated in a classroom led by a teacher, reading and writing, uh, structured hours and so forth, uh, the mode through which knowledge is embodied is the same. So this is a critique that my Guarani colleagues came to through their own work and curriculum. And now they're now grappling with, well, if, if, if the school itself isn't the place to decolonize knowledge, then, then where is it? Um, and a, a, an example of the household, going back to the household that, that Brooke wrote about, uh, often comes up in discussions, especially in the Andean region. Um, the Andean, uh, Aymara and Quechua, have a house ritual called the Utachanya. Um, the Utachanya is basically a, a series of social and ritual practices that go along with the establishment of a new household in uh, communities. Um, and the uh, students that I, that I worked with uh, said, well, you know, let's take the Utachanya as an example. And you can see that when you have a house building, or it's actually the roofing ritual that are staged in, formation, in relation to the formation of a new family, this is a moment in which the new couple initiates the process of achieving full personhood in the community, but it also a moment marked by the competent display of personhood, the reproduction of social and economic relationships into which these subjects are repositioned uh, in, a, in new positions, of social, territorial, and political economic relations. Home building and roofing practices mobilize extended kin, specialists like the Yatiri, who is charged with ritual blessings, skilled craftsmen who direct aspects of building, the Apus or mountain spirits who are asked to grant the couple uh, fertility and prosperity, and local authorities who collaborate in decisions about the placement of the house and the assignation of cultivable land. Uh, there's a physical act of constructing the house, there are a series of uh, rituals, symbolic items are buried in key places to assure prosperity and fertility, sacrifices to help propitiate earth and mountain deities, a ritual mesa or table, they might be laying and burned to ask for blessings. Um, the house is also adorned with meaningful symbols. The moon uh, as a protective mother, the sun as a source of illumination and knowledge, a pair of cattle for fertility, a ladder for prosperity, a cross for protection. I'm idealizing what is a varied practice across the Andes, so don't get me wrong, I'm not essentializing these things. Um, but the point is that in juxtaposition with this biopolitical approach to the Andean household of, of the, the sort of 19th, 20th century and, and neoliberal model, you have an understanding of knowledge as socially embedded practices that go far beyond the sort of questions of individual morality and so forth. So um, if you look at knowledge in this way, um, the household is not a space of racial degradation or cultural backwardness to be improved by education. 
but it's a multi-layered social phenomenon through which multiple kinds of knowledge are deployed to reproduce a broader social and particularly territorial collective. Um, so uh, there's some more details about what specific types of knowledge that entails, but what does this imply when we think about indigenous knowledge and education? Is that educators are confronted with this dilemma. Okay, we have this type of practice which is embedded in, in, in community lives and so forth. How do we address this in schooling? Is this something that schooling can, can mobilize for different kinds of, of understandings for different forms of uh, uh, inculcating knowledge into youth and so forth? Um, and here it is that the discussions are often stifled by an overarching bureaucratic model of schooling. Uh, the educators themselves, who are trained in old-style schooling systems, say, well, the, you know, the students, kind of like you hear here, oh, the students can do a project. They can go out and interview elders about the Utachanya ritual, and they can write a paper on it. Uh, or students might take a field trip type activity to observe an Utachanya ritual and write and discuss it in class. Or maybe elders or experts can come to the classroom to share insights into the practice. And so even here in rethinking indigenous knowledge beyond the, the limits, you, have, you see how the school, the school itself, molds your ways of thinking about operationalizing it uh, in practice or re-operationalizing in practice. So this was the, the limits of interculturalism, uh, the curricularization of local forms of difference. Um, as I say in the book, in some place it's kind of like diversity in a corporate office. It does little to address broader structures of inequality, even though uh, uh, the diversification of curriculum was an improvement on the past. It was ultimately constraining. Um, so what then might decolonization be in broader terms in relation to broader transformative processes? Uh, the efforts to recognize and curricularize knowledge can easily lead to folklorization or the reproduction of a racist model of cultural hierarchy. So indigenous becomes a marker of folkloric alterity, the Utachanya ritual, subsumed within the existing model of schooling in the state. And while schooling itself could maintain its role as a place where indigenous students are expected to improve themselves through gradual absorption into a, a bureaucratic model of knowledge production. Um, though defended by indigenous intellectuals and advocates, including myself, bilingual education uh, ran this risk, this risk of bureaucratizing indigenous knowledge. Um, and it also had opponents on the left, opponents on the right, and opponents even among indigenous communities. So, um, as I say, indigenous peoples are not constrained, or I guess my point here is that we should not just sort of think about indigenous knowledge as something that uh, will be sort of operationalized through classroom practices and therefore to think about the decolonization of knowledge we have to think beyond the constraints of the schooling form and this is one thing that I think some intellectuals in Bolivia are confronting but the, the, going back to my statement about productivism and the, the rise of the developmentalist state it is also something that is almost off the table for other Bolivian intellectuals and leaders who have very little critical sense of, of what schooling is and what schooling does. Um, so you, you probably know about the gas wars of 2003, uh, the election of Evo, Evo Morales in 2005, and the rise of the new approach to de decolonization. Um, it's usually invoked, decolonization is usually invoked on two scales. The first is that of the country itself spoken of as situated in a struggle against imperialism and neo-colonialism. Uh, obviously distinct from neoliberalism's embrace of globalization and competition, decolonization highlights racial and economic inequality within the country and extends this understanding to critically reassess Bolivia's place in relation to the rest of the world. In this vision, hierarchies of race and class and the ideology of Western superiority that seek to justify them bring to light an unfinished project of Bolivian nation building. So decolonization at this scale is tied to a fairly western <coughs> sense of nationalism. It's an anti-colonial nationalism. Uh, but yet, on the other hand, it's tied to the elevation of indigenous histories and collectivities into in a newly reconfigured relationship to the nation state. Uh, Raul Prada, who is one of the, the more erudite, uh, the most erudite, um, often confoundingly so, intellectuals in the mass, uh, 
uh, as a useful phrase, it's called the articulation of pluralities. Um, probably not his, uh, he reads a lot of Deleuze and Guattari, but uh, the articulation of pluralities as a mode of rethinking not just some sort of <coughs> creation of ethno-territorial units within the state, but actually uh, uh, re manipulating cartographies, in other words, rethinking the actual territorial and uh, his historicized territoriality of the state, I can say. Um, so, um, this has not yet happened, and there have, there have been limits uh, to this as well with the new constitution, but this new education law sought to put this in practice by turning away from the pro-market agenda and speaking of education uh, as decolonizing, liberating, anti-imperialist, anti-globalization, revolutionary, transformative of economic, social, cultural, political, and ideological structures oriented toward the self-determination of the peoples, indigenous, originary nations, Afro-Bolivian, and other cultural expressions of the Bolivian plurinational state. This was, of course, immediately interpreted by the opponents, especially the elite, uh, the agro-industrial elite of Santa Cruz, as a turn towards primitivism and indigenous fundamentalism. Uh, one observer who's allied with the Venezuelan right wing uh, saw these statements as an anthropological curiosity. Uh, even so, the proposed new education law also borrowed heavily from the language of neoliberal education reform. It speaks of quality and efficiency. It argues for equity of opportunity, much as the World Bank claimed to do, and portrays, uh, at the same time, education as a means of battling linguistic, racial, and ethnic exclusion. It does elevate indigenous knowledge in a rather essentialized form to equal status, but it also acknowledges the value of scientific knowledge. Uh, education would, quote, unfold through the development of the wisdom and cosmovision of indigenous peoples in complementarity with the advances of science and technology. So you see this dichotomous view being replicated in the new education law. Um, the new program suggested that beyond interculturalism, which would be rethought as dialogue and interaction between culturally distinct Bolivians, there would be a new notion of intraculturalism, this refers to the defense and cultivation of one's own cultural identity through practices of revalorization and revitalization. So against that sense that indigenous people's cultures were a problem that had to be addressed, the new law resituates indigenous cultural matrices as something that themselves uh, uh, are to be revalorized. Um, if interculturalism was previously interpreted as a way to manage threatening cultural difference, Interculturalism in the decolonizing mode was often interpreted as a program in pursuit of racial equality. Uh, when Felix Pazzi, the first education minister, was often interviewed by the press and asked, what, is, what does this mean, decolonization? You can imagine journalists, you know, much like some of my students, what does that mean, decolonization? And um, rather than expound on deep theoretical questions, he often referred to issues that sounded a lot like affirmative action. He said, indigenous peoples have long been excluded from access to jobs and political power, and now the time has come for that to change. So that was the way it was sort of translated into, into, into journalistic speech, was as a kind of affirmative action agenda. Um, and of course here, in reference to the title of this talk, this is what provoked the ire of the right wing, that this was in fact reverse racism, that the Indians were now turning the tables on the Criollos or the whites. Um, Interculturalism in this new view would be a prerequisite to intercultural exchange. Interculturalism would create the basis for a plurinational state based on equity, solidarity, complementarity, reciprocity, and justice. So here you see the possibility for rethinking indigenous knowledge not as something that would just be transformed into curriculum, a sort of diversification of curricular practice, which was the old, old style, but now it could be a fundamental underpinning for the reconceptualization of the entire school system. And the extension of that was that interculturalism, intercultural decolonization was not simply a program for indigenous peoples, but would apply to all Bolivians. All right. And this also uh, led to proposals that all Bolivians would become not just bilingual, but trilingual in English, Spanish, and the indigenous language of their respective regions. Uh, which was immediately attacked as well as being uh, making no sense for people who had no reason to learn indigenous languages. 
um, and, and has not yet been put into practice. Uh, and as Patsy responded to these critiques, he also made a key symbolic move at the beginning of his term, changing the name of the Ministry of Education and Culture to the Ministry of Education and Cultures, at least decolonizing the sense of culture as leading ultimately towards the sort of Western cultural uh, goal. And I was thinking today, I said, well, you see the limits as well. What he should have changed was it should have been Ministry of Educations, uh, if you were really going to think more deeply about it, which, which they haven't done as yet. Um, in any case, one of Patsy's phrasings on decolonization would mean, quote, to put an end to ethnic boundaries in the caste-based society that for 514 years monopolized academic, political, and labor opportunities, and to create an education system with a political and ideological focus that proposes itself as liberatory, anti-imperialist, and revolutionary for the reaffirmation of the originary indigenous nations. So these were the kinds of phrases that at the time, that we're talking 2006, 2007, basically gave fuel to the fire that was already raging between the Eastern elite and, and Evo's uh, government. Uh, phrases like communitarian, which were part of the new constitutional proposal and the education law, were attacked as communistic. The decolonization of education was attacked as communism. Uh, references to Fidel Castro came up alongside the idea that uh, <coughs> knowledge would be implemented in schools. Uh, the right wing and, and large sectors of the teachers union, ostensibly many of them allied with Trotskyite and left-leaning parties, also allied with the elite against the education law, uh, saying that uh, this would lead to uh, a, a pact between the devil and Fidel Castro to take over the control of Bolivian children. Um, so the Catholic Church as well, which has a, a, an interest in control of several thousand what are basically charter schools in Bolivia, uh, opposed the law even though sectors of the Catholic Church had long supported bilingual intercultural education. Evangelical schools, private schools, private universities all gathered together to stage massive opposition to this education law. Um, so, as of Patsy lasted for about a year and a half. And this was the first sort of chipping away at the decolonization agenda. Uh, he was replaced by a teachers' union leader who was a former member of the Communist Party. The teachers' unions fought neoliberal reform for over 15 years, and they thought that with Evo they would, uh, they would take it back immediately. When Evo named Patsy in, he was giving a nod to the decolonizing turn. It did not last, and he eventually had to hand the ministry over to the teachers. Uh, that fellow did not last very long as well because, as, as in the past, uh, he was uh, more concerned with strengthening the teachers' union than showing loyalty to the MAS. And eventually this fellow was replaced by Magdalena Cajillas, a respected uh, Bolivian intellectual and member of the traditional Bolivian intellectual elite. So by the third or fourth year of Evo's term, education had basically done little to, to, to drastically change it, actually returned in a sense to the notion that an elite criollo intellectual should be in charge of schooling of the Indians, I'd say, put it in crude terms. Um, two years ago in 2008, uh, another ship was made, there's now a new education minister, Roberto Aguilar, who is also a criollo intellectual out of the university system, uh, so a fairly traditionally minded intellectual, I say that in the sense of their background as opposed to a fellow like Patsy, um, who nonetheless uh, maintains rhetorical support for the indigenous education agenda and the decolonizing agenda. The education law to date has not been passed. It's supposedly up for discussion in the next month or so. Um, there was one other note. And Patsy, unfortunately, who played a significant role in the Constitutional Assembly, uh, was recently caught uh, in a drunk driving thing, and now he's basically ruined his reputation. But he's uh, uh, started his own party uh, to run against the MAS in, in La Paz-based uh, uh, La Paz-based prefectural elections. So, um, so this was sort of the rise and fall, and maybe resurgence of decolonization in the post-Evo education field. 
Um, so going back to this distinction between the, the cosmology view of indigenous knowledge and the socially and territorially networked view of indigenous knowledge, um, I suggest that uh, one thing that indigenous movements like my colleagues, the Guarani, are now confronting is that uh, a lot of the energy that was put into education, very important, very significant transformations to de-racialize or have an anti-racist form of educational practice in schools cannot be seen as the sort of limit of where you think about decolonizing knowledge in broader terms. Um, and so one of the, this is now bringing it back to the connection with gas and, and, and sovereignty over resources. So one of the outcomes of the Constitutional Assembly was a new legal category of indigenous autonomy. Um, that's material for another paper, but in effect, uh, what possibilities lie for joining this kind of epistemic concern with decolonization with the political economic concern is the possibility that gas resources might contribute to a decolonization of economic relations at regional levels uh, and the national level, of course. Um, so, uh, Guarani now, in speaking of autonomy and mobilizing for land reform, and this is happening elsewhere in the, in the country as well, are confronted with, with the possibility that they may recover a, a land base that gives them a certain amount of uh, uh, agricultural base, but are now actually thinking about how to reposition themselves as economic actors to break down this, this, this sort of ongoing patterns of extraction that still characterize the relation between urban and rural Bolivia. Um, so, how might this happen? There are some other tentative changes going on. Evo has supported the foundation of indigenous universities in three regions. And, uh, you know, American academics romanticize these universities as being spaces for altar thinking and other thinking and border thinking and boundary thinking and that sort of thing. Uh, but the Guarani University is a fairly purely technical university that uh, the Guarani themselves are concerned with getting training in uh, agro-industry and oil and gas industry, veterinary sciences, uh, and so forth to uh, both insert themselves into the regional economy but also to think about new economic activities that break down the kind of, uh, their position is simply a, a reserve labor pool for them. So this is something I don't have much to say about because it's what we're, what's being rethought now is how to to think about decolonization not simply as rewriting textbooks but as transforming these uh, territorial economic structures. Um, so I think given the fact that a lot of you have as much interest and knowledge about Bolivia as I do, uh, I might just um, conclude with that. Uh, Part of this paper goes on to suggest that uh, all of this was written basically as a, a, as a counter to liberal cr critics who see uh, indigenous education as a kind of a Taliban-like project uh, to basically suggest that no, there's nothing that fundamentalist or radical about it. Um, and in fact, that as Charlie Hale has written about uh, racial politics in Guatemala, the critiques of Evo and the critiques of decolonization are preemptive strikes. So the claim of reverse racism uh, is, is what he calls a preemptive strike against the indigenous challenge. So um, if we rethink indigenous knowledge not as a corpus or a cosmology that should be contextualized in a folkloric sense in textbooks, but as a territorially networked set of practices that open space for articulation both with the nation state and with other social movements, um, I think we can get a better sense of what is happening in Bolivia with this articulation of, of pluralities uh, and both stave off critiques from the right, uh, which suggest that it's this primitivist, romanticized, anthropological curiosity, as well as critiques from the left, which come from within Evo's party itself, which suggests that the turn towards decolonization discourse and the idea of indigenous autonomy is going to, quote, Africanize or Balkanize Bolivia by breaking it up into a bunch of ethno-territorial polities. Uh, this also, at least, uh, does not seem to be the, the, uh, the outcome, even in the near or longer term. Um, so, against closure, ethno-territorial closure, and radical epistemic practice, uh, 
what I see is uh, multiple forms of territorialized articulation that seek to reposition indigenous peoples in relation to others rather than to create uh, uh, spaces of, of closure. I think with that, well, let me just add one other final example put on the table. So this decolonizing nationalism, the articulation of pluralities, is also underway. It's something I've just started looking at. We had uh, Elisa Kanki visit us a couple weeks ago. She's working in the Ministry of Planning on another aspect of the rethinking of development uh, uh, discourse in Bolivia through the term living well, or summa kamanya, uh, as a way to question uh, development discourse, it's as if a bunch of anthropologists got power down there, um, to deconstruct development discourse and rethink the meanings of development in the terms of living well. And uh, there again, it's something that's sort of wait and see what this might look like. Paradoxically or ironically, uh, uh, she was telling me about being involved in a project to come up with the indicators for living well. So, <laughs> so I'm not sure that uh, we're done with Foucault quite yet. In, so, um, in any case, I'm sorry, that was sort of broad brush strokes. I hope, uh, hope it's given you something to grab onto. Thank you.